thanks again for for being here with me today. Um, I know it's my a pleasure. Really interest, yeah, it's really it's. I mean, uh, I'm honored that you could be here. Uh, I know it's a very interesting year for you, and I really want to get into kind of that. But before we get into that, what's your origin story? I love this question, by the way. Uh, it's so like Wonder Woman and, you know, Marvel heroes. And for me, it's a little less interesting than, say, the Spider-Man origin story. But for me, it all began in 1960 in San Francisco, California. Um, I was born a month early in January to a couple that were polar opposites. And this is a defining feature, I think, of my life. My mom was Quaker an active Democrat, a teacher, and my dad was an active Republican in the, in the Air Force intelligence. And he was stationed there. And so uh, I grew up surrounded by political heated conversations, which I think makes me comfortable inside of sometimes what might be feel uncomfortable to other people because I was I lived it all my life. Um, in, in my early years, we moved a lot because my dad was in the military and my first memories are from Taipei, Taiwan, where I was raised for several years. My parents say my first words were Taiwanese, which I kind of love because I think from an early age, I was really curious about the wider world and probably thanks to just this travel and, and you know, living in a, in a different culture. And we kind of moved every two to three years um, through my life. Uh, and up until the age of 10, I was an only child. So my sister was born in 1970. Um, and a couple years after that, my dad got ordered to go back to Vietnam, his second tour to shut down the war camps. And my parents were really worried about me at that point and thought I should attend my mom's boarding school because I'd be in the same place for three years of high school. And so I went to West Town School in Chester County, Pennsylvania, and it became one of the biggest decisions in my life that you know changed me forever. I just love the three years there in this Quaker educational community. Um, and I think, of course, it's why I ended up sticking with independent schools in my career, because I just loved what happened to me there and, you know, wish that everyone could have that kind of sort of transformation. I kind of woke up. Um, I like to say it's like that scene in, you know, Wizard of Oz where it goes from black and white to color. That was my experience of those three high school years in a boarding school. And um, so shortly after that, I went off to college, went to Mount Holyoke up in New England, and then kind of wandered around with my art history degree for a year, ending eventually just writing to two Quaker schools, Georgeville and Westtown, Pennsylvania, asking them, do you have any, do you have any jobs? Do you have anything for me? Because I didn't want to live at home anymore after college and ended up working in both of those schools in my alma mater in the admission offices. And um, eventually thought after about five years, I needed to get a master's degree and headed to Boston and to Harvard. Um, at that point, NAIS was headquartered in Boston. So during my degree program, I could actually do independent study with, um, with them and with the Office of Boarding Schools. And at the end of my degree, it turned into a full-time job. And that's when I veered into association work, left schools, and uh, you know, been there for 36 years, um, always involved with independent schools. But, you know, 40 plus years of being involved with independent schools, but, you know, mostly involved with associations. I worked for the Association of Boarding Schools, I worked for NEIS, and now, of course, with EMA. And I've lived, you know, in Boston and DC, and now just outside of Princeton, New Jersey. So that's how I kind of got from, you know, birth to where I am today. And, you know, very grateful that independent schools, you know, awakened in me something incredibly um, special and just really feel strongly that everyone in the world deserves the chance at a transformational education, which is why I sit in the seat I sit today. Wow. Something interesting that you mentioned, because uh, I grew up in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. Really. Yeah. And actually, my family now lives in Westchester, the Westchester area. And oh, yes. I go up to visit from the D.C. Baltimore area, I pass West Town School. Yes. Growing up in, in that area, not a lot of kids went to independent schools. I think culturally in that area, you went to the public school, so you were all together. You may have gone to like the Catholic parish school, but then everybody yep. sort of rolled into at least the high school. Yeah. Certainly, I think there are other places in the United States where culturally, if you had the means, you went to the independent school as opposed to the public school where the public school was sort of like, well, it's sort of a, a lesser version. Um, you know, any thoughts on like how that's evolved or 
culture, yes. the, the, the expectations or what, what parents want and families want as opposed to public versus independent? Yeah, I mean, I think about Chester County, it's just a great segue because um, I sat on the board at Westtown for, for a few years anyway, um, in the early 2000s. And boy, had things changed from the time I was a student. You know, when I was a student, they were still able to recruit and have a significant number of Quaker students in the mix. That was sort of the mission of the school to serve Quaker students. Uh, but things were changing just outside the door, as you allude to the fact that there were pretty decent public schools in the area. So you had to make a conscious choice if you wanted your child at West Town. Some families did. They had a small lower school and middle school at the time. Um, but it, weirdly, just down the street, outside of that little campus, uh, NBOA uh, president Jeff Shields lived on Johnny's Way, the road right outside of West Town School. And he went to the public schools. And we ha we've had this conversation about like kind of what would what would you think if you were on the public school looking at that point yeah. at West Town? And it wasn't always good, right? People sort of thought, well, why would you send your child yeah. away? Or why would you think that, you know, not to use the local school system? I think what's happened though is increasingly, if you look at what's happened to the landscape around West Town, uh, very expensive houses have gone up in what used to be farmland and um, I think the aspirations of people who've moved into those homes has been to make sure their children have a great life. And so they have both put pressure on the public education sector, uh, really building even better public schools there. And also they've shown more interest um, in that private school just across the way from maybe their homes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of a both end. And I think COVID, of course, through a Hail Mary pass for so many of our schools, because uh, public education, by and large, had a real hard time responding uh, during the first year of those the, the sort of COVID challenges. And many schools responded well, some schools stayed open. And so if you had the money to consider them, uh, many families looked to our schools and um, decided their children would go to private education because they couldn't stand what was happening for them, you know, elsewhere. Um, I don't know if that the roses off the bloom now. I'm hearing an awful lot this summer from schools that say many families just aren't willing to pay the fees. They've made choices. They've had bigger attrition than in previous years. We'll have to wait and see what the national trends are. But truthfully, I think, you know, we're looking as a community at, and as a wider country at a demographic cliff that's going to drop, for, particularly in some states. And so I think, you know, heads and enrollment leaders are going to have to work even more tightly to understand their school's condition and then respond, right? And make the value um, proposition even better. And even in some cases, maybe think about consolidation with other schools nearby to uh, build a, a better business model. So, you know, I, I'm not saying any of that will happen at West Town School, which right. is a lot, pretty large school. But I think, you know, looking at the wider, you know, national lens, uh, schools have got to be thinking about the 10 year out horizon and looking hard at what's happening, you know, with demographics in their area. Because if you're a day school, you don't have as many options, say it's a boarding school that has a world to recruit from. And to me, this is, you know, this is something to really dig into and understand. So you don't kind of over plan. I think a lot of schools bumped up in the COVID years and now they're settling back into maybe the right size. and. Um, thinking differently about, you know, how to build um, build themselves to last into the future, right? You know, I, that's such a good point. As I look at, you know, I think about the questions that were written to us and the ones that we had we had talked about before. That's a really, really good point. Is uh, you know, and the, and the question, the next question is, is independent schools blank too much? And <laughs> as you're talking, and you know, I is they they my answer is independent schools think about the here and now too much oh. and think that in five years everything is going to be fine when the demographics are are what they are so for you i mean fill in the blank oh, i like your answer i like your answer better than my answer but <laughs> yeah. they're kind of the same actually i had embrace the independent schools embrace the status quo too much like um, and I've just seen a lot of, you know, I think every, you know, my own response to change usually is if it's foisted upon me, I don't love it. Right. And so think of those COVID years and the craziness. I mean, 
It was a really weird time in our lives, a once in a lifetime experience, let's you know, knock on wood hope. And I just think change is really hard in institutions and so many of our schools really like we're, we're constantly evolving and changing during those months and those years, responding to all kinds of new needs um, from families, from students. And the level of exhaustion when we return to normal or the next normal, I think was real. And so I'm seeing a lot of, um, I don't know, not digging in, but hardening, if you will, in our institutions kind of post pandemic. And I really think, you know, what's happened to students and kids during that time requires some updated thinking. So I wish we didn't embrace the status quo and always kind of go back. Although, you know, there's a, a proverb from Jim Collins, my favorite business writer, and he says, you know, um, stimulate, the, like, preserve the core and stimulate progress. And what he means is there are some things that are core to our identity that you just never change, right? Your mission shouldn't change, you know. Uh, how you show up in the world, the values, right? But sometimes you have to change the programming, the the, the experience side of it. And um, so to me, I think if we cling too much to old things that don't help students, mm -hmm. we're not living our mission in today's world. And I guess that would be my cautionary, you know, um, tale to educators and to school leaders. Think really hard what needs to be preserved um, and, and don't preserve things that are no longer useful or I'll give an example like at West Town School when I was there we had a tradition of calling our teachers our female teachers teacher first name teacher Anne, teacher Melody right and the men were called master so-and-so master Tim master and it had been going on for centuries and finally a student of color said I, I'm not doing this this is not okay and you know students wrote protests uh, and asked the, the, the staff to respond. And I remember sitting in a faculty meeting and everyone sitting in that room was like, why have we preserved this tradition? You're right, these kids are right. Everyone should just be called teacher in their first name now, right? But it was really hard to get, we had several meetings to get through that. We got through it finally and on the other side of it. But it's those kinds of things that we've got to really examine anew and um, and think about what, what are the traditions that really matter for our students? How do we ground them? And then how do we also teach them to innovate, to think in new ways uh, about the complex world that they're gonna inherit? Yeah, and, and when you think about the business model of school and something you just said, the digging in, and I think that there's always sort of a delay because there's a digging in. And I get that because that digging in pieces for the students. You just don't want to sort of like willy nilly try different things and say, hey, we experimented on your kid's class for the couple right, of years. Right, we'll, exactly. we'll figure something else out. Right. But I also think that sort of outside influences are kind of pushed away a little bit. But I think organizations like EMA having a, a track record of excellence and helping schools, obviously with enrollment, but in different aspects of that. Yeah. How do you foresee EMA evolving on behalf of schools mm. um, in the next two, three, five, ten years? Yeah. And not just evolving to help them, but to show them why this is important in moving forward as a as a as a business, but yeah. also as a school. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, this has been obviously a lot of conversation being happening on our board on this very topic. Obviously, they're finishing up the, the sort of job description for my replacement and thinking about the skill sets needed around it. And it's really provoked some interesting conversation because uh, when I came in in 2011, I was really tasked with building the association side. At that point, it would be fair to kind of describe us as sort of a testing organization, largely, with a little bit of membership work on the side. And I think we've flipped the model a little bit, <laughs> really digging into building a membership side, member services, research, professional development that didn't exist before. We've also, you know, tried really hard to innovate the product line. So we now have, you know, the tests, of course, and that's where they remain the biggest, you know, source of revenue for the organization, even in a test optional world. But we've built other kinds of assessments, um, a common application, you know, uh, lots of other services surrounding that. And what we've heard consistently from the membership, and this came out loud and clear at last year's um, annual conference, is families' feedback to our schools and enrollment leaders in particular is just so hard 
to apply to your schools. You make it so difficult. If I want to apply to three schools, I'm in and out of online applications and financial aid services. and It's just not consistently built and it's not easy to access. Um, and so to me, that's the big opportunity that sits before EMA to try to knit together and integrate in 2024 and beyond, we shouldn't have technology working against us, right? And we have the convening power to both bring the practitioners to help us think carefully about the right journey that we want to bring families on. And also um, the ability, we work with about 50,000 families, well, actually a little bit more than that every year. And the opportunity to really do better by both of those groups, I think is important. We have, um, as I said, that membership side that's really been built out during my years, and we serve about 1,200 member schools now. The flip side of this is that we also have a product side, mm -hmm. and increasingly, you know, we're running up against other ed tech organizations that are in our space. And so, my guess is that we're going to have to build out our product strategy line in ways that we haven't imagined. We've also added global services recently at EMA, and there's just incredible demand. <laughs> to keep expanding and serving like schools around the globe. So I think we'll see some global growth um, in independent schools that are looking for community, even if they're on the other side of the world. So uh, those are my thoughts. And I think, you know, what we're doing at EMA in the last year of my time is thinking about just what does student success look like today? Um, what do we need to do with our products? that make things easier, more accessible, and also provide really useful feedback. So for an example, the score report that goes with the SSAT this year has been uh, re-engineered to give really deeper information to families about specifics that their child, the things they miss, the things they were really good at. So you'll get your regular scores, but behind that will be a, an additional page of information about whether you hit the critical thinking uh, skills well, whether you blew all the Algebra 1 questions, <laughs> Just deeper information to help the student uh, identify gaps they may have from the pandemic years, because that's the one thing we keep reading about when we look at um, issues surrounding education post pandemic is every child has some gaps. They just do based on what they experienced through those years and helping families figure that out and then you know put additional services around or helping them find the right tutoring to fill in those gaps. All of that, it, it's a more diagnostic approach, I'd say, and I think you know, I look at what my friends in the admission and enrollment space have done in the last couple of years, and they've become more sort of diagnostic in the way they've worked with families to try to best match their school program to the needs of students. And I think even teachers in our schools have taken on more tutoring, taken on, you know, additional responsibility to try to help these kids, you know, patch it together, right? And um, so I, you know, I, I feel like that's going to be with us for the next decade as we live with these kids who had such a disrupted, you know, set of. There's so many stories circulating around the little ones who don't have the hand, you know, the motor skills because they didn't have, or the or the skills with, you know, community skills of working with others, just because they didn't have two years of being with other students. So I think we're going to watch this roll forward. And someone on my board who is a researcher said we'll see societal effects from the pandemic that we won't like, right? Because kids who don't have um, core skills and socialization, for instance, end up having worse absenteeism in school, et cetera. So I, part of me thinks independent schools are sort of the best resource to try to attend to the issues to make sure kids are as whole as they can be having lived through such a disrupted time in their education and their lives. Yeah, I think, you know, and that, Personally, my my daughter, my youngest daughter was it started kindergarten in the fall of 2020. Kindergarten. Oh. Wow. At a desk. Oh. And I were trying to work. My other daughter, we each had our own sort of room. Mm. It's just, it's tough. And yeah. because of that, you know, she was just recently diagnosed with dyslexia, which, mm. you know, I, I having worked with an, uh, an LD population, I, I the signs were there, but I said, is it? Yeah. Is it this or is it just the two years of, of at a desk and, as opposed to being with other kids and with the right. actual teacher? And right. as we've kind of gone through this process, you know, having worked in that type of school and also having read, um, you know, uh, Woodcock Johnson's full bad tests and, yeah. and everything that goes with that, 
you know, being able to say, okay, here's what needs to happen. But what I'm hearing from you, and, I, and, and I, it really makes me excited, is you've got the school, you've got the parents. EMA is really bringing them closer together. And all of those, you know, not really in a patchwork way, but right. in, in, a, in a way that kind of really brings it all together at, at the same time. Right. Uh, along with that, though, um, and, and as someone who, you know, is an agency owner, if you will, I don't love the term mm-hmm. agency, but that's a whole other thing, <laughs> is I have a, a, you know, I voice first going to your, I don't have one in the room right now, Alexa and saying, Alexa, open the West Town School. We're going to love, love a lot of props, but West Town School. <laughs> um, and then she'll prompt you, do you want to order lunch? Do you want to know the sports schedule? Yeah, yeah. So, brilliant. We're going to start doing this for schools. And they were like, well, we don't get it. I don't <laughs> So all of that legwork that, that I did and our team did, and you know, we didn't sell any of those products. So is there anything in your time, even though all of this coming together, that you, there's a great idea, everybody got behind it, and it was just sort of a fail forward or didn't work or, or anything <laughs> like that. I don't want to call it a flop. Uh, I don't think anything I've done was a flop. It just didn't work uh, to learn from it. <laughs> anything in your time at EMA? Oh yeah, sure. Like lots of it. Um, the one that just, I mean, I still have nightmares about, you know, the worst one in my my almost 14 years is the SSAT at home rollout during the pandemic, of course. So terrible year, you know, 2020, in the spring of 2020, we started, of course, as everyone did, seeing the signs of what was about to happen. But back then, it's hard to remember and put it together in your brain, but back then we thought it'd be over, you know, in a few months, right? So. I said to the board, you know, let's just find a way to get the SSAT online so we can provide, you know, that to our members and, you know, by next spring we'll be all fine. Of course, things got much worse, but the prognostication was completely off. Um, But I told my team, let's get, we've been, you know, for years experimenting with digital testing. Let's go, let's do it, right? So my team dove in. As an aside, it was personally a terrible time for me because my husband died of cancer just as the pandemic started. Um, And he died at age 63, far too young. I was numb as a leader. You know, I had a great team, but we were in the middle of such a disruption. We were all working remotely from home. We didn't have a roadmap, right? We'd been experimenting with digital testing and we had to figure out how to get a secure test to online testers, you know, by the fall. And so, the first two months of that experience for students, just terrible, and for our schools, even worse and vexing, right? Um, we had to shut the program down for over a month to fix code. Um, it was just beyond frustrating to everyone, and people were over us. And we had built up such trust in the early days of the pandemic. We brought people together online in the spring to talk through how to run an admissions office. So it felt like we burned all that trust up, which was very upsetting to me as, as the leader of EMA. Um, But, you know, here's the story years later, of course, it took us several months to actually get things stable. And then we continue to offer SSAT at home today, right? Weirdly, and back to that earlier thing I said to you, um, most schools have returned to paper-based testing like it used to be if they do want testing. And, you know, it turns out developmentally that that may be uh, like the best mode possible because kids like to be able to use their pencils and paper and, you know, not um, not do everything digitally. And so uh, the demand has grown in that space. People prefer to drop their kids off, let them take the school experience test and pick it up versus having to worry if their computer is going to work on this at-home test. So we've seen a shift in preferences, but that experience was just a terrible one for everyone inside my organization. And I, you know, hats off to my amazing product team. I mean, they were unbelievable working with the partner to figure this out, to get in there and dig into code night and day and weekends, then to babysit for well over a year to make sure everything would go as well as it could. Um, And I had said to the board, I remembered in my interviews before I was hired, isn't it time for us to have an online test, right? But turns out it's really hard to do that. Why isn't the SAT? Uh, Finally this year, they're actually online for the first time. But you know, it's actually really hard to do it and make it secure and and make it a good experience for kids. And guess who found that out? Me. (laughs) So, um, you know, I I think what my lessons learned from that, um, gosh, you know, don't rush things and think through uh, the experience side of it for students, because the last thing we wanted to do was add even more 
um, challenges to their already challenged life. And so for that, I feel really, you know, bad and feel, you know, as we, if we didn't, you know, help a lot of kids during that fall term when they were thinking about jumping into our schools. Um, but I, I also think I learned an awful lot about my team during those tough weeks. And, you know, there was a lot of grit and resilience among certain of them who really carried us over the finish line and fixing it. Uh, well, I mean, you know, that's starting back, you know, f uh, four, four years plus now. Yep. Obviously, what you should have done is gone to your favorite chatbot, ChatGPT, Gemini, and said, is this a good idea? Should we do this? <laughs> exactly. They would. <laughs> How, it, how how are you using uh, yeah. uh, yourself <laughs> and maybe EMA? How are you using it? And, you know, is, yeah. you talk about products, you don't need to do any, uh, you know, like, you know, what's going on in the lab, but how, yeah. you know, how are you using AI? How is EMA using AI? Yep. We're, you know, we're, we're being very careful stepping into it, given that a lot of the things we do are kind of high stakes, because um, we don't want to hurt a student's chance to get into a school of their dreams, right? But uh, we have a team working on the promise of AI. Right now, the low stakes ways we can use it are to have it, you know, write test questions for us for the practice area of our website. So we're starting there. Um, we're also, you know, we have, we have um, just years and years of information inside of our systems that we can use the AI to crawl on so that we can, you know, if we have say let's test scores for a school and if they give us information on who they enroll we can give them lots of information about the best match students uh, once they go through testing so there's these kinds of opportunities to use ai to give information to those who make decisions in the enrollment office i'm really intrigued some colleges are starting to use ai as an additional reader to check the human behaviors and potential bias inside of admission decisions. I'm aware of two big universities that are doing it and it's just an additional voice at this point. They're not taking over for the human side of it. Um, but I think there's promise in just having a set of consistent uh, standards you're trying, you're seeking for mm -hmm. students in especially very selective schools and saying, you know, how do the humans do on this? And what is the, what does the AI reader tell us? Um, and really interesting to teach the human side you know well there may be some other things we need to look at um at each student coming through if this is a really good match but we didn't select them for instance so really keen to follow that and, and watch it um i think long term ai is going to really revolutionize the way that testing and test development works and assessment works you know as i said we're putting this additional bit of information on every score report but we think over time in the next couple of years, we can give even more information to students um, if they give us more information up front. And, um, you know, you think about like the naviances of the world where students would go, you know, my daughter used it to apply to colleges and she got a lot of information about where she would get in probably, where she wouldn't get in, right? Some schools that might be interested in her that she had, hadn't thought of. There's an opportunity in that mix to do more with AI, but we have to train it well. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been very careful and cognizant that a lot of the AI in our education space is oriented towards white men um, who've built the, the tools. So we want to make sure we train for kind of a different world um, before we use any of it that's to be definitive about certain things for our schools. But a lot of experimentations, but I'll tell you, is going on. And I do think there could be services performed for sure inside of an admission office, inside of a reading experience for, you know, selected schools, admitting students. And for in our in our work, you know, absolutely inside of building assessment tools. So all of it's, it's there's experimentation in all those areas, but nothing particular, no product yet to announce. Well, yeah. I, I have a product and I, I don't know how to code or oh. software. And I, I wrote a blog about this four years ago. Oh, tell us. And I want to know. So, the sit, I, let, you know, you, I'm, I'm, you, let's pretend you're my AI right now. I sit yeah. down yeah. and I say, you know, good morning, Heather. And you say back to me, good morning, Trevor. It's, uh, let's say it's Monday morning. Um, we It's the end of the month. It's the it's the 30th today. So one yeah. day from the end of the month. Uh, during the month of July, applications were down for these grades, up for these grades. Um, because of that, we readjusted your Google ad campaigns in this to upbid on these keywords. Social media ads have now been transformed into oh. 
our Amazing. prediction is by the end of August, this is where we will be. And for based on all of the data we have in the universe, um, enrollment for 25-26 should be 562 students with this amount of financial aid. So, so you're doing predictive analytics with it, which is, you know, one of the- I don't know how, one. I just have the idea. And so no, that's a big idea because I got to tell you, that's one of the big questions that I get asked. And it's one of the items on the checklist of things <laughs> that I'll hand off to whoever takes over at EMA for me because schools really want to understand both how you think about predictive analytics and also would welcome from EMA just a standardized tool to use that they could regularly update their heads on and be trained on. So there's something in all that, I think, um, that and especially if AI can help you adjust as you're going through the year um, and look at outside patterns. To me, that's a gift um, that could keep on giving because sometimes you get surprised. You're, you're using last year's information without the nuances that uh, you know, in inside of a year, I, I say this to Deborah Wilson at NEIS, and you know, she agrees with me completely. Like, the data sets inside of Dazzle right now are largely a year old, right? You're basing everything off of that last year. Um, but at EMA, um, we have you know real time market data going on as people come through the process and apply, et cetera. And how do we amass all those common apps out there to produce some information in about active? enrollment inside of the market that then feeds data and strategy for schools, right? Oh, you're in New Jersey, things are up 10% or down, you know, it's those kinds of things that let you, I don't know, build a more sustainable and solid model. Um, and, you know, the way that markets are changing, a, a year is sometimes too long if things are happening, you know, it, it, you know, overnight in some cases, or if new schools are coming up or, you know, some schools are shutting down and all of that could be captured inside of an AI tool um, and, you know, put to good use inside of an enrollment strategy um, system. Yeah, I agree. Well, you've been so gracious with your time. I just actually have a couple more questions. And, and sure. those is for the future Heather Hurl, uh, <laughs> you know, the next generation to, to sort of be that person that like, What's, what's going on? What is she doing? What tips do you have for, for anyone who, whether they're working in independent schools now as a teacher, an administrator, or they're about yeah, to move yeah. into a school, what tips do you have for them to, you know, kind of be that 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 thought leader, that influencer in, in our space? Uh, well, don't be me, be you. I'm old news. I'm very much vibing with Biden right now. <laughs> like it's my time to, to move on and, you know, hand the torch off to someone else. And I'm excited by it. I can't wait to see what the next leader brings and how EMA changes and carries forward, right? But I will say there are a couple things that I would tell you in my career that made a difference in how I um, grew as a leader. And so they're nothing new here, but just good to underscore them. Um, the first thing, when I was a relatively young admission officer, you know, I volunteered for a lot of projects that just interested me inside of schools. I raised my hand all the time. I was like that triple threat, you know, early on in my career and in the dorms, teaching, working in the admission office. But I also directed plays. I filled in the okay. dean's office on weekends, right? All these things to, you know, thicken up my experiences and, and then help me better understand what I really love doing. And I, what I loved doing was admission work, right? It really became clear to me that that was the space I loved, right? So. You know, I would just say keep volunteer and, and keep growing your skills early on. The next thing I would say is try really hard as you begin to get a little more senior in your career, join a board. I have learned so much as a trustee for various boards I've joined and I've been on 11 of them now. And I just feel like each one has taught me more than I've given to it. But it really makes you think differently. It helps you understand how those entrusted with you know the leadership and the future sustainability of your school think. And um, so I would just say, by all means, try to find a way to get on a board or join. You know, EMA has a, lots of volunteer opportunities to be a faculty member or an advisor and, and a research partner. Like raise your hand and get into those things because you'll widen your lens, which really I think helps you be a better leader. 
Uh, third, I've said this many times, be careful who you go through life with. <laughs> I was very <laughs> lucky to be married to a guy who really allowed me to have big ambition and supported that. Um, so, you know, I was traveling constantly for uh, the end of my NEIS career and he, my husband was great. He was the backup guy, right? And helped raise our daughter. And um, it's really important who you travel with in life. You know, pick your friends carefully, pick your, if you have a partner, pick your partner carefully. I also found a lot of um, support, insight in having a mentor. And my mentor, my last great mentor was Pat Bassett, who was the president of NEIS when I was there. He was very challenging and kind to me, but he pushed me constantly. And I loved him because he always had a genial disposition, you know, but he never shied away from giving me direct feedback. Um, so he really pushed me to keep growing. And he even told me when it was time for me to start looking beyond. He said, you're ready. It's time for you to look for a leadership role. You're ready to do it, right? Find a good mentor in your life and have them give you the honest feedback, obviously couched in love. Um, you know, as I've become a leader in the last decade, I would think people could tell you early on, I would, was pretty much a workaholic. But when you settle in um, to your leadership work, you got to find balance because leadership work is lonely. Um, and so for me, you know, gardening and parenting and travel, all those things kind of rounded out um, a lot of devotion to the work. And, um, you know, there are things I'll carry off with me as I leave the work. And just make sure you have those things in your life that you don't give everything to your career. Um, because I just think that it, you know, it helps balance um, and makes you even a better leader, right? So <laughs> those are my, none of those are earth shattering. I'm sure everybody's heard those bits of advice before, but they've made a difference in my life to be sure. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I to add to that, I think the mentorship piece, I think is really flies under the radar. And I think one of the, the most fulfilling in my my last two years working in independent schools and a lot of times you know the competition we don't want to kind of meet and talk but you know i had a great group of, of fellow admission and marketing directors in the dc area we would meet for lunch once a month most of us wow. a lot of times it was a little you know chat about you know parents and, and you know <laughs> how they were kind of dealing with the process but we also shared a lot of how we were navigating the, the, the new um, platforms and applications and CRMs and websites right. you're using, what are you using? So I think mentor, absolutely. I've had two great mentors uh, in, in my life. We'll still do really have them. And I think the indirect mentors of, you know, following your content on LinkedIn and, and others content to see, mm. what, you know, what the thinking is and kind yeah. of the landscapes going on. So I, I totally yes. agree with that. I think sort of, I guess it's a mastermind group is kind of what I'm kind of describing. I love that. Yeah, yeah, a mastermind group. And it doesn't, you know, you can be a mentor too. That's the other thing. Like it goes both ways. And yeah. it's very satisfying to look back and think that, you know, when I announced my retirement, I heard from people, I mean, I, I've known them. I had no idea I had an effect in their lives. And it was really touching to hear from people, you know, 20 years back who, said that I inspired them at some point and helped them keep growing. Like that is just the best part of a career. So, you know, give um, give mentoring if you're at a place where you can do that. And um, it's, it's incredibly satisfying to see, you know, others take advice, move on, keep growing. It's just, it's a great part of the work. Yeah, well, I, I've followed your content on LinkedIn and I, it's it's really indirectly you've been a mentor of mine. Oh, uh, thank you. And so. <laughs> Uh, well, last question, what's next? You know, when are you, when uh, you you're retiring at the end of the year or September? Yes, I'll be retired next summer. So okay. uh, actually, I'll be in my last day next year, a year from today. Um, it'll be my last day at EMA. And I'm planning actually right away to go to Rome, Italy, where I spent my junior year abroad um, in the springtime and on this amazing program that was for art history folks and also for artists. Um, and they've been so smart to spin up an alumni program now for six weeks. So they offer it in the fall and I'll be going to Rome and just, you know, luxuriating for six weeks and yeah. learning again. Um, and then I don't know, there's a part of me, you know, I've been talking to consulting firms and, you know, I, I imagine that it might, I might end up helping and consulting in some way, but there's a part of me that's uh, been a frustrated creative all of my life. and. I never pushed hard there. I was sort of always defaulting to the art history, not the art, right? Or 
to the theater direction, not the acting. And so part of me thinks, I just want to push myself. Um, I kind of love that old adage from Eleanor Roosevelt, do something that scares you every day. And I feel like you have to keep growing in your senior years. So, I mean, I definitely want to travel and, um, you know, expand my creative talents if I can. Um, maybe write, maybe draw. So do some of that. Uh, but I imagine I'll also show up. My daughter tells me I'll be bored out of my mind after I get back from Italy. So she's thinking that, you know, doing a little something to help schools um, will be, you know, where I land. And I've certainly been talking to a number of consulting groups that uh, see how a number of senior enrollment leaders who have become heads of school have been incredibly successful. And so they're interested, of course, in working with me to identify you know, that next generation of school leaders and school heads. And so, um, I, you know, that would be a very fun space to be in, uh, working with my colleagues um, from the wider EMA, you know, community, especially if they're seeking headship. Yeah, I, I, and I, you, that's really something that I just love to hear because when when I was considering it, though, I will say, so I, I heads of school, I don't want to be in that position. I always thought I did, but yeah, I mean, I the daily grind, the, the, the mm -hmm. um, you, you know, keeping the ego in check, you know, this, the level of self-esteem you have to have is enormous. Um, but they were always the division head or someone right. on that side of things. And I would see colleagues of mine who I know are brilliant that are directors of admission, marketing, communication, yeah. now sort of the enrollment management piece of it. Yeah. In my mastermind group, getting, you know, starting headships this year or last year. And it's just so it's refreshing to see that you don't need to be that pure academic um, to, to yes. move into a position like this. Well, well good. Yeah. Yeah, well, and in fact, I, I think they're some of the best. And, you know, it's to me, that's what I would love to be advocating for as we look at the next generation of leadership, right, is, is bringing some of these skills to the fore. And there's a new book out by Tom Olberson, a search consultant for RG175. He'll be at the EMA conference in Boston, by the way, with his book. And it talks about, he talks about becoming a strategic head of school in the book. And he really is talking about enrollment management skills. So I told him, I you know, you don't, that's not the word you used, but um, strategy is embedded in the best enrollment leaders I know. So, absolutely. <laughs> well, I'll I'll see you in Boston. I'm looking forward. Excellent, to um, yeah. Heather. Thank you so much for your time, uh, your wisdom, uh, and I will look forward to seeing you in Boston. Thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you so much.